All right, 108.3 or something. I'm just saying that, like, if, if one side is saying that, you know, that, that, you know, the Obama administration was the most, you know, corrupt administration in history and in, in, in its trying to sabotage the Trump administration, the most blameless administration in history, that maybe there's a, a point of view that's somewhat more even-handed than that. Um, you know, we've, you know, we've been doing this for two and a half years, and, you know, it, it's clear that I would think that anybody's watched any, or anything, not us, just the world, would say that, that no administration, no set of leaders is, you know, is 100% awesome. Now, let me say my shit here, where um, I finished the Michelle Obama autobiography, and it's an autobiography, so obviously she comes across pretty good. Um, and my thinking, this kind of tended to, you know, and Hillary, if you listen to Lance, um, and, her, and the rest of her cabal are among the most, you know, evil people ever in American government. And I was thinking that fucking Obamas were not evil enough. They were not jaded and... Obama kept getting played. Obama kept thinking that, that he could make nice with the opposition and the opposition would meet him somewhere in the middle. I kind of wanted Hillary um, in, you know, before Obama. I would have I, I preferred you know, four years or eight years of Hillary and then four years or eight years of Obama because Hillary would have gone in there already pissed off and skeptical. Um, and I will give you, I, I want to get into an argument about how corrupt uh, Hillary was. I would, you know, I would say casually corrupt in certain ways, like she, they, the Clinton spent three million bucks on Chelsea's wedding. It's like, you know, you don't do that unless you're, there's a certain amount of jadedness going on. Whether that, you know, is the in, indicative of, of much deeper, and I don't want to fight about that, but like, I almost want somebody who has that degree of, of seasonedness and pissiness and, and on my side instead of somebody who's all kumbaya, like the, if you believe that the Obama, if you believe the Obamas at face value, that they were. Um, but, and Lance responded, but please, I'm begging you, I'm begging you, don't respond with a list of indictments against the, the everybody you don't like. Well, I would just like to say a prayer right now for the people of the black people in Libya. They're now the, no, the you're slaves. doing a list of indictments. Come They're on, now come slaves on, no, that's... because Obama bombed Libya. Uh, made sure that the place would devolve into complete chaos and stayed in office for at least two or three years afterwards and watched the slave trade go back into Libya. So now Libya is a failed state and they say that hundreds of thousands of black people are being sold into slavery by the Arabs of Libya all entirely because of Obama who toppled the Libyan government without putting in any kind of force to create order. So that's just, uh, Rick told me he didn't want a litany. So I'm not giving you a litany. You're just giving I'm, one. I'm only giving one. All right, so, I'm, so my, my but I'm going to finish my one. Okay. So my one example is that this innocent, saintly man, this sweetheart, this, this childlike, good person caused the enslavement of several hundred thousand black people. So thank you, Obama. You, you're a great guy. Thank, and thank you, Rick, for, for, for losing this argument so badly that anybody watching this will realize that you're completely naive, and that you don't have no idea of what's going on. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, you know, I'm not allowed to smash chairs anymore after last week, um, but in my mind, I am smashing a chair. Um, I, I just said that frickin' no president um, gets through his 
time in office without some, some major fuck-ups. And so, yeah, you can put that in Obama's fuck-up list. Oh, I guess it was just a fuck-up, huh? Well, just we, a little we, mistake, a little mis a little, just a little mistake. I just said a major fuck up. Now we could argue, but what's not? Because we've already had that argument a bunch about you know what, how overtly malicious Obama's. Like, let's not do. Let's move on to the next topic. Okay. I would, I would rather not. I would like to point out that last week and for the entire two and a half years, the only thing you ever say is that Obama made a mistake. Oh, he made a mistake. You know what? I don't think a 57-year-old man that causes hundreds of thousands of people to be turned into slaves, do you know there are images of them being hung by, they sell them by hanging them from their ankles so that their faces are in the dirt. They sell them that way by the thousand. That was not a mistake, Rick. That was the actions of a vile, evil human being that you love. Do you want to talk about Iran, Rick? Uh, do we want to talk you about Iran? Iran you want I mean, because uh, apparently, now we could, I could make the, uh, I don't feel like making the argument that, because, you know, I, I don't want to talk about Iran a whole lot. Well, Iran appears to be, you know, fucking around in the Gulf of Hormuz. Um, and Iran says since, Really? No, I don't want to talk about Iran. Okay, that's I want to move on to the next Well, thing. Rick may not want to talk about Iran, but I do. You see, Rick, one of the things that the Democrats have done in brainwashing you is that they've made you to a point where the most evil regime on Earth, a regime that's desperate to get nuclear weapons so that they can kill you, me, and Camille, and everyone we've ever known, that regime, when it's a choice between supporting Trump or supporting that regime, well, there's always that doubt. Maybe Iran, maybe Iran's blameless in this situation. After all, you can't side with Trump. Now, let me tell you but something. Hold, hold on, because I'm not saying Iran is blameless, and, and Iran is, has decided that they are going to stockpile more a uh, low-grade uranium, which is, is not a good thing. Now, but I don't want to argue about whether the deal would, whether, you know, trying to get them to stick to the deal, which I don't, you know, whether a different, a democratic administration would have uh, kept that deal in place. And, but I don't want to argue about whether the deal is good or not because we've gotten comments. Now you can argue that the deal would have, and you've said it. I'll go ahead and I won't even argue with you about it just to move on to the next thing. That you've claimed that the deal would have let Iran get a nuclear weapon, maybe not as fast as they would have wanted to, but it would have gotten it within eight years or something. You have a number of years that they would have been able to so, but let's move on from that to another topic. However, I'd rather not move on to another no, topic. Because people, you may want to, but I don't want to. It's a two-man show. Yeah, but I mean... And one of the things that we found out is that only months after Obama left office, the Israelis found a massive stockpile of, of information and, and records and experiments in, in warehouses in Iran. And, and, and they went in in a daring raid and they found all the evidence of Iran's cheating. And they brought it back and showed that Iran was continuing to develop their nuclear weapons. And uh, right months after Obama signed the deal with them. Now every Republican in the United States and every Jew in Israel knew that they were going to cheat on that deal. Netanyahu's uh, daring commandos found the evidence. And the only people on earth that still trust Iran are the Democrats and Rick and Obama. So hold on. So let's do one of the hated stop downs and you show me the reporting on it. And if the reporting's that good that every Republican knows this and every Jew, let's just show me the article that, that says. Okay. 
and we're stopping. All right, so 108.4. Okay, Lynch showed me an article which seems believable um, from Haaretz, an Israeli newspaper, which says that in January of 2018, Israeli commandos broke into an Iranian warehouse and uh, grabbed 50,000 documents pertaining to their nuclear program. Half a ton. Half a ton. That would be more than 50,000 50, documents. 50,000 pages and 163 compact disks containing files, videos, and plans. Okay. So, but, um, so yeah, they found out and this stuff pertained to, to sneaky shit that they were doing with regard to uh, their nuclear program. Um, but the thing that, unless I misunderstand um, the article, it says that all these documents pertain to Project Ahmad, which, um, and were from 2003 and earlier. Is that not right? There's a paragraph towards the bottom of the article that says that the uh, documents they stole that Iran was trying to hold on to, I guess, which contain valuable nuclear knowledge, um, was based on what they'd found up to the year 2003. So, okay, they're being sneaky, but it seems like they're being sneaky with uh, information that was 15 years old. I don't know. Well, in order, because, um, no, what it says here is that Iran was on the verge of bomb, of key bomb making technologies when the program codenamed Project Ahmad was halted some 15 years ago. Um, the point is, is that uh, the Iranians were supposed to reveal all that material. I mean, if you're, if you're actually not developing a nuclear bomb, you don't keep this stuff secret in a, in a warehouse where you can get to it and use it. You actually say, well, you know what, we were doing this, here's all of our stuff. Okay. All right. Okay, so going? then we're going to move on to Science Corner. Okay, while you're doing Science Corner, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. Pose. Can you turn just your head, at least if I can get your head done? No, you don't have to do your whole body. Let's just get okay. your head. All right. Can you just real quick, last tell us about the, an update on the, the sketch and what you're doing here? All right, well, the uh, Camille raised a very important point earlier, that, and I somewhat agree with him. We uh, started off this uh, show with the great premise that I was going to do a great work of art and we were going to talk. And now we're just down to sitting on chairs and me doing drawings. The reason I haven't been able to do a great work of art is that I never got a chance to finish the, uh, the big one that we did. And until it's finished, I can't start another big one. Uh, so, rest assured, I think this show is going to be go going through the next election. So, when I get a chance to finish the first giant painting I did of Rick, I will start another major project of Rick, either a sculpture or a painting. Now, yeah, you said um, you're, you're, you're inclined not to do a sculpture because my body's gotten all wizened. Well, it's not exactly that. Uh, your body keeps changing Yeah. and I'm not sure what to do, what kind of figure it would be. I don't know, but like it, I've gone from being a, 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 a vital late middle-aged man to kind of the beginnings of, of being an old motherfucker. And maybe that's an interesting contrast. I mean, I'll try to get back to being um, you know, the the muscly guy I was in the painting, um, but you know, it, it's hard to fight time. But I will fucking fight it. Well, I maintain that, yeah, and you guys can leave comments on this. We talked about protein, and I, one of our uh, viewers said that 100 grams of protein is perfectly healthy for Rick. He's worried about too much protein hitting his kid kidney. Yeah, and it, it's. And my kidney numbers have been not the best. And my, my argument is that he's very, uh, he's got a very uh, defined body, 
but I think you should be lifting heavier weights and eating more protein. Heavier weights so you could get more mass and of course sh smaller numbers of reps. So uh, why don't we ask the listeners, the viewers to decide, should you stay with the, the more uh, defined body, the definition, or should we go for more mass? Does that seem reasonable? Semi-reasonable. I got I mean, I don't want to have super high kidney numbers at age 59 and having had a tumor taken out of my freaking kidney. So I can't start running creat creatinine levels above like 130 and getting GFR kidney glomular or filtration rate numbers of under 60. Well, you know, I can do a more defined. Uh, kind of figure. I mean, you've got great definition. I could do a more uh, lively built uh, Rick Ross. I mean, they want to fine. do that. I mean, in my prime, I was in the, you know, I weighed 170, and now I'm in the mid 140s. And really? Yes. When did you weigh 170? While I was painting you? At some point, yeah, there's a drawing of me you where I lost I'm, 30 pounds? Yeah. Why? Because I don't, well, because look, you know, even the more minimal levels of muscle I have have been putting strain on my frickin' kidneys. Um, not to be racist, but there are two sets of, of kidney numbers for black people and for non-black people where uh, black people have, on average, higher levels of, of creatinine in their urine because they have a higher lean body mass. And I've got high lean body mass, which leads to disturbing kidney numbers. What, is high, what does lean body mass mean? The more muscle you're carrying around, the more there's going to be muscle waste that shows up in your urine. And there's no cheap and easy way to, to, com, to figure out how efficient your kidneys are, but on the more efficient your kidneys are, the less muscle waste you'll have in your pits. But black people on average have more muscle waste in their pits because they have more muscle in the first place. And I, to some extent, I suffer from that where it makes everybody freak out. Wow. But why did you lose 30 pounds? Because I thought I'm, I'm in my 50s now. I'm not bouncing bars. I'm not trying to get laid with my biceps. Um, why do I need to carry around all this extra muscle that only serves to put stress on my body? So you lost 30 pounds in two years? It, it took a little longer than that. While you, I was doing this painting, you lost 30 no, pounds? No, no. By the time you started the painting, I was already under 150. Anyway, um, and, sign by the way, a guy with a temper like yours probably should have more muscle because you might get yourself into trouble. Well, you know, when it comes down to it, I don't. By the way, you never did comment on Andy Reese's um, lance. She mentioned muscle. I mean, he's a heavyweight champion, but he's not chiseled. Um, well, I mean, we're finding out that it, it's, uh, I mean, uh, Foreman in his 50s wasn't real tr uh, chiseled. And there's, there have been a number of boxers that weren't beauty, you know, they weren't Mr. Universe type bodies. It turns out that having a lot of mass and being able to direct it into a punch is just fine. Um, the greatest uh, uh, MMA guy was a guy named uh, Fedor. Fedor Emelianko, I think. He's a Russian guy, and his body looks normal. It do, I mean, it doesn't look particularly muscular. He's a big guy. Uh, but um, it turns out that, that you don't have to be really defined to be strong and fit. Yeah, the Rocky movies have maybe given people the wrong impression because frickin' Sylvester Stallone is really good at training and getting a bodybuilder-type body. Well, it's not just the movies. I mean, there were guys like uh, Evander Holyfield who, you know, could just walk right out on a Mr. Universe platform. Uh, and uh, uh, I think Ken Norton 
you know, had, you know, a lot of these guys were really beautiful, well, had beautiful physiques. Ali had a good body, it but, it nice, but it was soft. Yeah. It was, he wasn't as ripped as, as a lot of people. The, it's um, not that he was soft, it's that he probably had like 3%, you know, body fat that they would have asked more body fat than he would have had if they'd asked him to play himself in a movie. They would have said, yeah, just get, get you know, a little more ripped. Right, right. I mean, well, I, what, it, what it turns out is, is that this, this new Mexican boxer, uh, what they're saying is, is that he uses the extra poundage to give more force to his punches. He's, he's throwing all of that weight into his punch. And uh, so he's not trying to win a beauty contest, he's trying to knock other people down. So it's not, uh, it's not necessary to be defined and perfect looking. Yeah, one of the, the marks of a good puncher is that they know how to move to, to support their, to add force to their punch by moving their body so there's actual, because if you throw a haymaker, which is one of these, you've only got the mass of your arm and fist behind it. You know, boom. Um, but if you, if you turn your body and straighten your arm as you punch, you've, you're, you're able to add to the force of the punch beyond the, the weight of your moving arm. Yeah. Uh... And there are other things about this guy uh, that, one, he apparently uh, is ludicrously experienced. He's, um, he's had over 100 fights, 100, over 100 professional fights, which is a lot more than, than, than hardly everybody else has. I mean, the, I mean it, it's, it's an unusually high number of fights. So he's, he's very wily. Uh, and, Does he get uh, knocked out much? I don't. I don't think so. No, but they didn't expect him to win. This was no. not. A, he was. He was the the real underdog. Uh, he was not considered a contender. There are apparently three guys that are considered that were the contenders, and he was a warm up fight. Uh, but he had skills too. He's been boxing since he was a child. Like, he's, he, he, he's not one of those people that starts, you know, when they become a teenager or in their, in their pup adolescence. He's been fighting, uh, in, he's had some weird, very, very early development. So all of his <coughs> movements are, are like second nature. You know, he, he started so young. So he's, he, it turns out he had a lot more advantages than people realized. But, and, but, but <laughs> let me just finish. Uh, I have more to say. Another interesting development, though, is that there's a guy named, is it Tyler Fury? Ty there's an English boxer. Uh, a Tyson, Tyson. Tyson. Tyson Fury. He's six foot nine. And I was watching uh, him fight. Uh, he's only, he's never lost a fight. He's only drawn a fight with one of these other three contenders. Wilder. Yeah, so what's interesting is, this guy looks unstoppable. And he's, let me talk about him for a minute because he's an interesting character. He, um, he is one of the three contenders, as we said, so, but he's, so he's good, he never lost a fight, but he's, as I said before, he's six foot nine. Now, a lot of people don't know this because it's counterintuitive, but being tall is not usually that much of an advantage in a fight. In fact, very often being a few inches shorter than the other guy gives you an advantage. Uh, in, usually the tall guy loses when they've done studies. The one, the one that's kind of lanky, uh, because when, when someone's absurdly lanky or tall, they usually don't have a lot of power, and the shorter guy can get in there. They, there's reduced leverage. So what happens with this guy Tyson Fury, though, I watched him fight. 
and he he was fighting a, a pretty solid boxer uh, who uh, maybe was not in his league, but the guy was was a was you know very good, and he toyed with him. He he knocked him out in the second round, and he he did this, and and Tyson's famous for having done this in a fight too. He dropped his hands, and he let the guy. Uh, punch at him, at his face, and instead of trying to block them, he just used head movement. So he, he actually avoided being hit maybe five times with just head movement. A six foot nine guy is that agile. So um, I actually, it was too late at night, I was desperate to see the fight he had a draw in with this guy Wilder. Because now nobody, you know, apparently there's only one guy that even can draw him, and, and, and I'd like to, they're planning a rematch for that. But now both of these people have to contend with this Mexican fellow who was apparently born in the United States with an American passport, but is not uh, loyal to our country. He, he thinks of himself as a Mexican, which is, I think, kind of pathetic because. I'm Jewish, for example, and I don't think of, I'm not loyal to Israel before my own country. I wouldn't. Uh, uh, I don't take my ethnic pride to that level. So I think it's sad when people take their ethnicity before the United States. That's that's really sad. I think during a different period, he probably wouldn't be doing that as much. I think he's making. It really good point. All right, science point. We're going to talk about consciousness for and free will for half a second. You and I have talked and we've kind of agreed that there's not free will because what you decide is based on information. There's informed will. That when you make decisions, you want it, your decisions to be based on the most reasonable picture of the world that you, your senses can and your thinking can develop. You don't want to be tricked by your own mind into making bad decisions. Um, but it turns out According to current brain science, it's very fashionable to say, and I'm not disagreeing with it, that the brain's function, I think we talked about this last week maybe, that is thought to just set you up for what happens next. Your brain wants to develop a, a model of the world so that it can help you decide what's going to happen next and then get you, get you in the right stance to address what it thinks is most likely to happen. And, but furthermore, studies of consciousness shows that you see your, your brain has like a set of possibilities, things that can happen when you're driving. You know, you know, like three major things and maybe eight minor things if you wanted to make a list. Um, but it also has a set of possible responses for each of the things that could happen, kind of teed up. You know, swerve, put on the brakes, yell fuck you. Um, it turns out that your brain makes the decision in split-second situations about what to do before you consciously decide what to do. Which means that in situations like that, you don't have free will as much as you have confirmatory will. You confirm what your brain decided unconsciously. It's like you swerve and to get out of some asshole, you know, on a scooter's way, and um, then after you've already begun your swerve, you become consciously aware that you're swerving, and you're like, yeah, swerve, that's it. And um, you don't even realize that you were swerving before you had conscious, were consciously aware that you needed to swerve and consciously decided to swerve, the decision had already been made, but your consciousness had woven it into your story of experience in a way that made you think that you made the decision consciously. And that leaves open the possibility for contradictory will, where your reflexes want you to swerve, but you're looking at the situation as it plays out and you're able to exert a certain amount of conscious force that makes you think, you know, if I do swerve, I'm going to hit this other car and then that's a whole insurance thing and can I 
maybe avoid the dipshit on the scooter without swerving so far, so you're contradicting um, your, your split-second action in the next split-second. Um, but, but according to the latest science, or science in the last 15 years, a lot of the decisions you make that seem conscious are pre-conscious with consciousness coming in later to smooth everything over and make you feel like you're in charge. The end. Are we done? Is going to wrap? Well, let, I, let, me, let me respond. Okay. This is actually a very important subject for, for those of you that don't know, this is a philosophy 101 subject. The reason it's so important is because people have debate, debated for thousands of years, since the Greeks, uh, since uh, uh, I probably the early Jews thought about it too. They've debated about whether people have free will. Because if you don't have free will, then you're not really responsible for anything you do, good or bad. You're just reacting to what your situation and the genes you have inevitably force you to do. Uh, whereas in order for there to be a moral system, and a good God, you have to be able to make a free will moral decision. So this is actually kind of comforting to me because one of the, uh, one of the great uh, proponents of atheism is a fellow named Sam Harris. And Sam Harris says that one of the reasons that he knows we don't have a, a free will and therefore no God, really, to speak of, is that uh, the mind has already made a decision subconsciously, or before you even know you've made a decision. Uh, in, in the studies they do, uh, when they ask you to make a decision quickly, you usually make it before they can find that decision being made when they attach electrodes up to your brain. So, so in other words, the decision is often made before it reaches consciousness. So what Rick is saying is actually kind of relieving because what it means is that your brain is making the decision. It's just preparing you. And so that doesn't mean that there's no free will. It just means that your brain is sort of thinking ahead in situations. So it doesn't mean that you're just a robot. It means that your brain is... is is more uh, thoughtful, I guess, and, and just planning ahead. It, 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 it actually doesn't deal with the free will issue as much. Because the, the point is that Sam Harris is making, and I just want to make this even more clear, is that if you're making decisions without being conscious of them, then you're just a robot. And they're, therefore, you're, you're, you're not a moral being and there is no moral God. Though you could argue, and I think the justice system does this to a certain extent, um, that justice is to a certain extent based on statistical dickishness. So if you have, if you take a hundred people and subject them to, the, you can't really do this because, but subject them to roughly the same temptations and forces and. If 97 of those people don't do the bad thing and three do, those people are statistically dicks. Now you could argue that there's no free will and something in those people made them do the dickish thing that only three out of 100 did. But we've decided that if you're going to be that big of a dick, statistically, well, we're going to say that, yeah, you're responsible for being a dick. I don't know how I'd have to think about you know actual situations of, of justice, but I would guess that there's a, that that's at least somewhat the basis of judging people. Yeah, well that's a, that is a, philosophers say, look, you have to have some kind of justice system. You can't, you can't say, uh, be so understanding that nobody gets punished. So in other words, if we, uh, you can't look back into every single uh, thief's life and say, well, you know, he never had a chance. It, it, inevitably, any of us would have done the same thing. So what justice, 
the justice system does is what Rick says. It determines what, what is fair for most people. The, the overwhelming majority of people would not have been a thief, would, would not have stolen. Therefore, we can apply our laws to this thief. However, what the, what the philosopher would say is that this is far more fine and subtle than our, our justice system could possibly uh, uh, reach uh, or, or evaluate. We're talking about the one time that the five-year-old spilled his milkshake and, and that embittered him and he ended up being more of a thief by a millionth of a percent. So in other words, when you're evaluating is there, can we blame anyone for anything? You have to know their entire life story. And the, the atheist would say, everything you do is explainable. Mur being a mass murderer is explainable. And therefore, you can't have a God that would create a world where you could have a life that would lead you to mass murder. And what the religious person would say is, no, you have free will. God gives you a way of rejecting those experiences of doing the right thing. I, I would say that in the current opioid crisis in America, and I don't know, I guess elsewhere, but it's mo we mostly hear about it here, you've got tens and maybe hundreds of thousands of people who are addicted to opioids, and people seem to have gotten the idea that once you're hooked on opioids, you are, your level of reliability, your ability to resist doing bad shit in order to get more opioids um, and related issues is kind of just blasted away by the force of the addiction. Um, I, I think that's kind of understood across the country that, that, you know, that these people are so messed up by the addiction, which is so powerful, that, you know, that you don't prosecute people for ODing, you carry those, those jump starter kits that bring people back and you try to get them into rehab because they're going to OD again and again. But the, 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 the idea of punishing um, opioid addicts, you, know, you never see that. You never see people railing against the weakness shown there. And I think that people are like, yeah, the addiction is so such a motherfucker that um, you know, accountability is, just goes out the window. Yeah, and that brings me to one of my favorite subjects, and that is that much or most of the op opioids brought into the country is being smuggled in from Mexico. And I just, I'm, I applaud Trump's efforts to control the border uh, as opposed to the Democrats who seem unconcerned about the thousands of people dying in this country at the hands of Mexicans or people coming over the Mexican border. I don't know why the Democrats aren't doing everything they can to close that border down. I don't want to have this argument, but um, I would say that it wasn't the Mexicans who got hundreds of thousands of Americans addicted. It was, the, it was Pruitt Pharmaceuticals. I think it's Pruitt, right? The ones who released the studies and, and marketed OxyContin and showed, said that OxyContin was not addictive and it turned out to be super duper addictive. But anyway. There, there are a lot of heroin addicts out there, for sure. But the, the, the heroin is like once you can't get the prescription stuff, then you go to the heroin and you go to the, what do they, they mix the heroin with the other stuff that makes it 100 times more powerful and you're 100 times more OD'd on that shit? It, what but I, uh, yeah, that stuff comes through Mexico too. China via Mexico, China and then through Mexico and stuff. I just, I just think it's amazing that twice tonight, you, you, your hatred of Trump is so great that you sort of had a nuanced view on the Mexican and the Iranian uh, culpability. You know, it's like if you've got to side with Trump against and, and, and protect the southern border, and if you've got a side with Trump and uh, against Iran, well, you know, you kind of see the other side of it. 
Wait, wait, I don't know what you're saying exactly, but I'm saying that, yeah, a lot of this shit comes through the southern border. We should probably index our frickin' episodes, but about whether it comes through the ports of entry, which are the places we where you drive. We had that argument. That's why I didn't say anything about whether it was the ports of entry or not. All right. But so anyway, that we wouldn't have to have that argument. I'm just saying that Trump is trying to close down uh, the, the problem we have on the southern border by arranging a deal with Mexico just this week so that they would put thousands of troops on their border and instead of loving Trump for that, you hate him. Well, all right, so, you know, I said, you mentioned 10 points in favor of Trump. And I've said that, you know, no president makes it through his term without some major fuck-ups. And conversely, no president makes it through his term without doing some good. And of the 10 things you mentioned, I don't remember all of them, but probably at least four of them, you know, I agree, that's, that's a good thing he's doing. And you know, you know, the way the Mexican agreement played out, we can argue about the details of it, but yeah, if it gets, like Mexico agreed to move a bunch of its troops to its southern border, yes, which is a much better place to try to stop movement because Mexico's southern border is what, 200 miles across? Roughly, you know, it's not as while the Me the border between Mexico and the U.S. is ten times that; it's two thousand miles. So yeah, it, it's a pinch point there. You can look at a map, and so you know, I have to admit that you know, getting Mexico to put troops on its southern border is, is a good thing, and we can argue about other. But this anyway, is a good place to stop. Yeah, let's do uh, that. Just one, just one quick, um, quick question. Just, that's something interesting that's going on. Uh, the government is now wanting to, to uh, force priests that hear the confession of a child molester uh, to reveal it by law. Do you think that's? Do you think that that should be? Well, this is the first I've heard of. Yeah, that's that's um, good. Uh, Can you just repeat it? The, the, the director just said that the. That the government, mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. government, the US government yeah. is considering legislation yes, uh, to a law. Uh, considering a law that if somebody confesses, uh, well, priest, Catholic priest, that well, oh, if a priest confesses, well, Catholic priest, if no, a priest confesses, no, here's a confession. If a priest hears a confession that involves um, child, molestation. child molestation, that they have to report it. Yeah. Um, I think at first thought, it seems like a good idea. Um, at second thought, there are probably some things that have to be considered. Um, and this is not to, well, I just, uh, in a related, not a related thing, but related only because it pertains to the church. Didn't the Pope just say that he would consider in places where there's a shortage of priests having older married, allowing older married people to serve as priests? Yes. Well, that seems like, I mean, I don't know about the confessional thing, but that seems like a great move, that you let, letting married people to serve as priests, you know, it's the Catholic Church, Whenever when people talk about religion and, and kids being diddled, um, it's the Catholic Church that comes up, and it's the Catholic Church where you can't be married and be a priest, so... That seems like a, a move to seriously consider. You know, it hasn't been that way since Jesus. I mean, it's like it's probably a, a rule that's a thousand or twelve hundred years old. But for many hundreds of years, you could be married and be a frickin' priest. You could be, couldn't you be married and be pope? Probably early on. Uh, I don't know about being pope specifically, but I know that you could be married and be a priest for the early centuries of the church. And they had one of those councils. Uh, I don't know if it was the, the Council of Trent or the Council of Nantes or the Council of Nicaea. Nicaea. But one of those councils, they decided that the priests wouldn't be allowed to get married. And some people think it's because they didn't want priests to be able to acquire property and uh, pass it on to their children. They wanted it to always go to the church. So who knows why? Um, I have several points to mention on this. And 
as Rick often does, I'm going to take the opportunity to make a pop a reference. When I was a kid, there was a baseball player that was squeaky clean. He never swore. He always smiled. He was, he was Mr. America. Everybody thought he was Mr. Clean. And his name was Steve Garvey. And uh, late in his career, it turned out that he had gotten two women pregnant outside of marriage at the same time. And so we were, uh, I was driving on the freeway and I saw someone with a bumper sticker that said, honk if you're carrying Steve Garvey's baby. Now, I thought that was very witty and it came to mind when I was listening to the radio today and I heard an ad, um, here's a number you can call if you've been molested by a Catholic priest. I mean, there are so many people that have been molested by Catholic priests that they're actually doing radio advertisements to Greater Los Angeles, which has nine million people in it. So on that note, I have several points I'd like to make. Can I just say that Steve Garvey is my ex-boss's favorite baseball player? Well, yeah, he was beloved as Mr. He was Mr. America. You had to love the guy. He was handsome. He was a great player. You know, but anyway, apparently, you know, too charming for his own good. So, um, one of the dirty little secrets about the Catholic, uh, the, the scandals of the child molestations that is not mentioned in the media, in the liberal media, but this is Rick versus Lance, so we tell it the way it is, regardless of whether it's PC. 90% of those kids that were molested were uh, gay priests molesting little boys. Uh, so it was, it, it was uh, people avoided carefully saying that it had a homosexual predominance by far. The second point I'd like to make is that they're beginning to do studies and it turns out that an enormous number of Catholic priests are gay. Some people say it's as, it may be as high as 40%, but the average in the United States among the general population is roughly 4%, and going up, by the way. But uh, even if it's 30%, even if it's 25%, I would say that the Catholic Church has gotten itself in, into a real problem because they have to sort this sexual situation out. And if they can't or won't, I think it's the end of Catholicism. It'll only be the religion of people from very, very primitive uh, third world countries where old traditions apply and it's easy to manipulate the masses. But as a, as a religion for sophisticated people that are well-read and have other choices, it's going to start dying out in favor of perfectly, you know, reasonable record churches in the, uh, 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 in the Protestant faith that don't, that have uh, not a big problem with all this. And my concern is that I don't think the Catholics the Catholic Church will be able to solve this problem. And the reason is a fish stinks from the head. The, 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 the problem is it's, it's in the hierarchy. And so I don't know how it's ever going to reform. I don't think you're arguing that gay people are more pre inherently more predatory than non-gay people. I think that the, I think that the, 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 the increased proportion of gay priests versus the general population is to some extent an artifact of earlier times. Well, when, actually, you know, everybody is quick to say, well, just because you're gay doesn't mean you're going to molest a child. I'm not saying that, but I am saying this. 90% of the kids that were molested were boys by male priests, and apparently, 
uh, as, as high as 40% of the priests in the Catholic Church are gay, which is against the precepts of the Catholic religion. But but another, wait, I'm not done. Okay. So the Catholic religion theoretically is against homosexuality as well as child molestation. And I think both of these situations will be to some extent ameliorated if we just throw out the celibacy thing and say, look, we're going to promote heterosexual married men and, by the way, women to the priesthood. I, th I, <clears throat> I think that uh, it's, it, there's no doubt that there is a cabal, a conspiracy of child molesters that have wormed their way into the priesthood. Because they're not doing this alone. They have found a home in the Catholic Church. And they've used that. Uh, and, and very often child molesters work together. That's, that's how they succeed often, is that they form networks in things like uh, Boy Scouts or uh, any organization where there are a lot of children. You will find networks of child molesters. And unfortunately, that has ensconced itself in the Catholic Church. So we, we have a problem that they may not be able to recover from. But... I would say that married men and women and females that become priests would not would would be able to help root this problem out. And let me, as the guy with purple hair, my kid purpled her hair and there was half a bottle left, so I'm like, all right, I'm not going to waste it, so I purpled up. Um, let me say that you could fix the problem even gooder with the church if you let people of any gender marry each other. Boys married to two guys, two priests married, two boy priests married to each other. Yeah, but, but since since one of the but, but I mean that's not going to happen. But, but since since the Catholic Church is officially yeah, it, against it won't happen. homosexuality, that wouldn't solve the problem. Well, it would if they would allow it, but it's not going to happen. You could uh, anyway. In other or, words, the, the Catholic Church thinks that homosexuality is a sin. It doesn't think having women priests are a sin. It's just not a custom that they've indulged in. Yeah, all right. So it happened in Disneyland. Did you want to talk about that once? Are you guys tired of hearing me talk? No. I don't know. I thought we needed to wrap, but... Well, he, there was something... All right. Fine. Um, one of the... Uh, I've been interviewed... I don't have enough money to go to Disneyland anymore. And, uh, but I'm very interested in it, and I've talked with several people that came back from, from Galaxy's Edge, which opened this week. And uh, what I'm hearing over and over again is that it is the most beautiful, elaborate, and technologically advanced shopping mall ever created. And so you go there and you feel like you're in a place that is just trying to soak you for every last dime, but has this amazing uh, scenery, uh, which is now this morning there was a new uh, article uh, uh, and many news reports about a change in, in one of the attractions at Disneyland. They have a little place on their, their main street where you can see old films of Disney cartoons from the 1920s. And for the first time in the history of the park, they've actually installed a merchandise uh, booth or several merchandise booths inside this attraction. So you can't even see 1928 Mickey Mouse, black and white, without being sold some sort of trinket. Um, so again, in, in two very obvious ways, Disney is throwing out the charm of the park in order to make more money. And it's what I, my, my advice to Disneyland is that 
if if you are selling a if you're selling somebody, if you're creating an experience for somebody, it has to be, the majority has to be charm, and then you should have the ability to buy a souvenir. If the experience is majority buying souvenirs and only a little bit charm, then people are going to see through it and they're going to stop going. So my advice to Disney is if they want to save themselves, you can't make every possible dollar every possible moment. You have to give people more charm and less merchandising. I would think that they've done, they've focus grouped the heck out of that. I, I, when I think of Disney, I think of what they say about Native Americans and Buffalo, that they came up with a use for every part of the Buffalo. And Disney, I mean, it doesn't, miss a trick when it comes to, uh, you know, to monetizing stuff. Um, I read an article a couple months ago on, for 200 bucks you can build your own lightsaber. You enter this attraction and it appears to be a store of, of, of not for lightsabers. It's this, it's, this, it's this dealer of used stuff. But it's, a, it's like a speakeasy. It's a secret lightsaber store. And you go in and you pick out stuff, and there's a raid by stormtroopers in the middle of the process. And you have to hide your stuff as they come through and they check for contraband. And it's, it's an experience that costs 200, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're you know, in this world where you're trying to hide from stormtroopers, but also for 200 bucks you get to walk out with a lightsaber. Yeah, and, and what, what I'm saying is that, I'll give you an example, and real Disney buffs will know what I'm talking about. There was a little area behind the pirate ride. It was called the Court of Angels. And it was a beautiful little place where there was nothing in it but a, a, a beautiful staircase, some benches, and a little fountain. And people used to get married there, they used to take pictures there. It was considered the heart of the park. And a few years ago, they closed it so that they could make a more expensive uh, club there, sort of a restaurant um, called Club 33. And they, they gave that space over to the, the rich people that were eating at this restaurant. Well, I ate there. It's nice and well, not super cheap. The point is, is that I knew that a sea change had occurred. I knew that they were going to start, they were going to remove the charm in order to make more money. There was a, this, this incredible uh, mania for using every square inch of the park to make more money. And it, it's like, it, uh, what I'm saying is, there's a point where it will tip where people will say, you know what? This is too much. I don't mind buying a souvenir. I like the merch, but I'm fed up. The, you know, you're, you're cutting in to my enjoyment of the park by constantly trying to sell me things. And that's what, uh, it's possible that Galaxy's Edge may fail because of that. I, I don't think it will. And I agree with you. I think people are, in general, going to kind of slowly sink into uh, the quicksand of market-driven, um, intense, emotional experiences. I saw the, the Elton John movie, Rocket Man, a couple days ago, and, you know, it, it's, a, it's a biopic where, uh, it frequently peels away from reality. Oh, Rick. Hey. You wouldn't hit me, would you? No. <laughs> okay. I, the most I would do is hit you with my stick from the painting. Okay. Which is just a bamboo stick. I wouldn't swing, I'd go back. But anyway, I, I don't hold that stick anymore. But anyway, at the moments where what was everyday reality of, of Britain in the 1950s turns into this big production number, it's so powerful. Um, Spoiler alert. 
well, the, I got all teary. And I think that entertainment is, in conjunction with market forces, gets more and more powerful. Um, more, I mean, you can see it in people. People cannot stop working their phones. And they cannot stop playing video games. Video, video game addiction just became a diagnostic thing, a, a thing in the, you know, an official... And the DSM. I think, yeah. or some, some, some group of therapists said, yeah, it's a thing. And we will become more and more kind of cogs of the worldwide entertainment sphere. And it'll be ecstatic. We will be entertained all the time. But we will, you know, lose something in that we will, well, we'll lose the power of self-determination because we will be subject to powerful forces of information that are uh, just undeniably addictive and delightful. And we will sink delightedly into a sea of entertainment. And your entertainment has just come to an end. Well, See you last, next week. Oh, one last on. question, this is for lads especially. So they talk, they're talking about exorcisms, and we talked about this the last time. And the, 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 the number one exorcist in, in Rome said that it's not so much the person that's possessed by the devil, but it's temptation that is even more evil than actually being possessed. Because the person that's possessed has no free will. Right, exactly. Do you right, want to so comment on that? We kind of already have. Did we do that? Right well, we now? just, I mean, because when we're talking about sinking into a sea of a powerful inner information that, that strips away your your will to resist the, the deliciousness of it. Do you think that's the devil, or do you think that? No, I just think it's market forces. That's well, what, what I think is... And technology. The, the, what, the, what the priest was trying to say was very, I think, very wise, and that is that uh, ac according to the Catholic Church, there is such a thing as possession by Satan. Uh, and that's, you can argue whether that makes sense or not, but that's what they say. But what this fellow was saying was that Possession by the devil is infinitely less of a problem than people not being able to control themselves in their normal lives who are not possessed. So uh, he's just saying that we need to work on developing and cultivating the conscience of your average person. And I think that that's why there are so many mass shootings these days. Because in when you were younger, there were murders, but there was always a reason for the murder. It was very rare that there would be people that would want to murder innocent people, uh, who would want to shoot uh, 50 people, or a terrorist that want, would want to blow up civilians. These things are happening because a basic uh, a basic barrier to that kind of thinking has been taken away. There, there, uh, in other words, there was a time when people feared God. And when you don't fear God, when, when, when those restraints are pulled out, I think you end up with senseless acts of violence, which is what we have now, where where people kill somebody that didn't do them any harm. So it's not, it's it, because they fear no God. They fear, they fear uh, that the universe is empty and there, there will be no retribution. No, uh, in the back of their mind, there's no fear of ultimate judgment. Whereas that kind of thing may have stopped people in the past. Well, I'd, I'd say it's, that's one dimension of it. Another dimension is, now, I don't want to get into an argument about guns, but obviously you know, the, being able to get an, an AR-15 makes it easier. I mean, and there are other guns, there are other ways to, to acquire an arsenal. You don't need a, a semi-automatic rifle. You can, some of these killers, you know, they, 
They just have a lot of pistols and a lot of ammo. Um, there's also that we have 300 and almost 30 million Americans, and there were, you know, there were big killings in the past, not, not on the scale that we have now, but the, part of the problem is there's just a lot of people in the country, um, a lot of arms, um, but you know, in, during the World War I era, we probably had, what, 80 million people, less than a quarter of the people we have today. Um, you have big media exposure for people who do this stuff. I mean, it, it's a bunch of stuff, including um, the, the, the erosion of social structures that you're talking about. Well, I think that actually percentage-wise, they take into account the percentage. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's higher and now. We do, we do have higher murder above mass killing rates now than ever. And, uh, I but it wasn't know. unheard of, and, te and terrorists. No, it wasn't unheard. There were mass murderers. And there, there was, was terrorism. A, there was a years there ago. There was a mass murderer at the world at the Chicago World's Fair. Killed like fifty people by torturing them. And terrorists blew yeah. up Wall Street in the nineteen yeah. teens. So, so no, like, people have done this, but but it it, it was. Uh, I get checked for weapons many, many times during the week in Los Angeles, the different places I go to. That was never necessary. I would like to make a small technical correction in case people are watching this and actually listening for mistakes. Um, all weapons are semi-automatic unless they're a revolver or a muzzle loader. So uh, the difference between a semi-automatic and an auto, an automatic is a machine gun. You hold down so the trigger and it just keeps firing right, without you having right. to pull it. So an, an AR-15 is a semi-automatic, meaning you pull once, shoot once, pull once, shoot once. But with a small adjustment to a semi-automatic, you can turn it into a, a machine gun. Right, I don't think most shooters do turn it into a machine gun. I think right, but you could if you if yeah. you want if you were of of a malevolent character or if you wanted to own a machine gun. Just a little technical. Yeah, I mean, that's what the bump to show stock, that we know the difference. Yeah, that's what a bump stock does. It uses the recoil to pull the trigger for you, basically. Okay. I believe, right? People uh, out yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so are we done now? Okay, Thank great. You. Thank you. Good night. Good night.